grace, mercy, and peace to you. From our God who creates us, redeems us, and makes us a holy people. Amen. Back in the day, when we still had weddings in churches, lots of young brides would wear a strand of pearls on their big day. A friend of mine shared a story about a very, very special strand of pearls worn by one bride. The bride's grandmother had brought those pearls with her when she escaped Nazi-occupied Warsaw. The grandmother, Sophia Pedersen, had carefully sewn this particular pearl necklace into the hem of her skirt. She was prepared to barter or sell it for safe passage, for food, or for new beginnings if she and her husband would ever reach the United States. Imagine her joy when she was able, eventually, to pass this very treasure on to her only granddaughter on her wedding day. How wonderful to have such a pearl of a story, pardon the pun, about a wedding garment. It counters this rather disturbing story about the wedding garment in our gospel. This is one of those gospel readings when I'm tempted to say at the end of it, the gospel of the Lord? Jesus seems to be speaking with a forked tongue out of two sides of his mouth. And by association, so does TLC much as we want to faithfully share God with all people. On the one hand, today the king in this parable who seems passionate about Jesus' radical hospitality invites anyone and everyone, all people, to this wedding banquet, the bad and the good. On the other hand, when he discovers that one of the wedding guests isn't dressed right, he throws him out. What is up with that? How can we expect someone who's just been dragged in off the street to be wearing the right clothes? I wonder if this story disturbs us because we don't quite get the whole picture. We don't live in ancient Jewish culture. You see, it was custom in ancient Judaism for the host of the banquet to provide each guest with a wedding robe. Maybe these days we can relate to this because of face masks. Some businesses and churches, ours included, provide face masks for people who come in without wearing one. The robes at these weddings were handed out free of charge. All the guest had to do was put it on and join the party. To refuse to put on the garment was an insult a rejection of the gift and all that the gift represented. Can you imagine that young granddaughter bride refusing to wear her grandmother's pearls for her wedding? Can you imagine her rejecting such a gift and all that the gift represented? Wearing the pearl necklace was not simply a question of taste or preference or even duty or obligation. It wasn't about the pearls. It was about what the pearls represented. The pearls were the outward visible sign 
Wearing them was about claiming the story. Wearing them was about embracing grace, embracing the experience, strength, and hope that had come to define this family. Wearing the pearls was about letting that same grace define her. So what if the wedding robe in our gospel today is a gift like that? What if the wedding garment, not unlike the pearl necklace, tells a much bigger story, a defining story for the family of God? What if the wedding robe tells a story that changes everything because it changes me? There's a little book by a pastor named Rob Bell called Love Wins. Rob Bell writes in this book about the story of the prodigal son, the story of the son who squanders his inheritance only to be welcomed back by his father with open arms. There are two versions of this story, Bell says. His, meaning the reckless son's version of the story, and the father's version of the story. When the father welcomes his wayward son home with the celebratory banquet. What the father does, in effect, is retell the son's story. And the prodigal son has to choose which version of his story he will believe, which version he will trust, which version he will live in. Hell, says Bell, is our refusal to trust God's retelling of our story. What the gospel does is confront our version of our story with God's version of our story. What if putting the wedding robe on signifies our willingness to claim God's retelling of our story? Like the garment of hope and promise we put on at baptism. What if wearing the wedding robe is like being clothed with Christ through water and the word? What is baptism, really, if it's not being reborn into God's version of our story? The story of a God who claims you in the waters of baptism and meets you at the cross in suffering, pain, and death, who walks with you through death to the promise and power of resurrection over and over and over again. The story of a God who says, there is nothing you can do to make me love you anymore. And there is nothing you can do to make me love you any less. Once we trust God's version of our story, we live differently because we see differently. We create hell, Bell says, whenever we fail to trust God's retelling of our story. God's version of your story stands in stark contrast 
to another set of two stories about a wedding banquet. One story takes place in heaven, and one takes place in hell. In hell, the people gather at a banquet table overflowing with abundance of the finest food and wine imaginable, yet they're emaciated and sickly. Their faces are sullen and drawn. You see, despite the abundance, they can't eat or drink because their elbows don't bend. And they're unable to bring their hands to their mouths to feed themselves. In heaven, the people cannot bend their elbows either. But they are laughing and singing, feasting and satisfied, because they feed each other. This is Stewardship Month at TLC. This is what stewardship is all about. This is God's version of your story. This is moving God's mission forward. This is the story I know you trust enough to live in at TLC. And it changes everything. Amen.